On Sunday, the Chinese ambassador to the UK, Liu Xiaoming, said in an interview on British television that China is not interested in a diplomatic war with the UK and rebuked Jeremy Hunt, the UK foreign secretary, for his code war mentality. He also reaffirmed China's commitment to the one country, two systems arrangement and urged the UK government not to interfere with internal affairs of China. What's behind the UK's increasingly hostile tone towards China and could the so called golden year in bilateral relations begin to lose its luster? I'm pleased to be joined in the studio by Ms. Han Hua, fellow of Chongyang Institute of Remy University of China, and from the UK, Professor Tom Brooks, Dean and Professor of Law and Government of Dunham Law School. Uh, welcome to The Point, to both of you. Let me first go to Professor Brooks. Um, Mr. Jeremy Hunt has spoken repeatedly and publicly supported mm -hmm. Hong Kong and its freedoms, after, especially after rioters broke into Hong Kong's Legislative Council complex last week. He suggested uh, as a consequence that sanctions could be taken against China. And when asked exactly what kind of sanctions, Mr. Hunt then said no foreign secretary would ever spell out precisely what would happen in a situation like that. You need what uh, Bill Clinton yeah. called strategic ambiguity. So, Professor Brooks, are his concerns legitimate or reasonable about the UK mm. and about the Hong, I mean, about Hong Kong and its freedoms? Well, I, I don't think so. I think what's, what's very, there's a lot of problems here. I think that uh, one of the problems is uh, he's foreign secretary uh, of a government that is uh, uh, deadlocked um, uh, right now. You have a prime minister who is, uh, who's resigned as leader of her party, Theresa May. She'll be stepping down as soon as, as her political party, the Conservatives, choose a new uh, leader. Um, is it the Conservative Party, the government, Her Majesty's government's view that they have concerns on Hong Kong or not? I've, got, I've seen nothing of the kind. So he's Foreign Secretary. He should be speaking on behalf of the government, but it seems that there isn't any government that's actively making any policy mm -hmm. right now. So I don't know. So he doesn't seem to be doing that. Yeah. The other thing I think is, is a problem. So I think he's, these, these are comments as the Foreign Secretary that he's doing kind of on the fly, making it up but uh, speaking of, but as a member of the government, but not on behalf of a government. That's, He's also been behind really in the weird. polls, uh, that's behind really uh, Boris Johnson, and I think... That's hmm. really weird, because as uh, the Foreign Secretary, right, uh, Ms. Han Hua, let me come to you, you are supposed to speak on behalf of the government. You can't just speak as a member of the government, and, or you can't just make it on the fly. You have to know what you're talking about. And when he talked about, when Mr. Hunt talked about possible sanctions, on China, that sounds like uh, very much a threat against China, especially when it is China's domestic affairs that we're talking about. Uh, does it sound like that to you? Uh, yes, Mr. Hunt definitely go, uh, went beyond the boundaries, as I put it, because the Foreign Affairs uh, Secretary is supposed to take care of the foreign relations with the other countries. This is what he or she is supposed to do. And uh, the Hong Kong affair is purely the inter internal affairs of China, so it's not under you know, any legitimate uh, uh, territory of Mr. Hunt. Even though China, uh, Hong Kong was the colony before 1997, but it is already in the past history. So there is no legitimate reason for Mr. Hunt to make that remarks. And uh, what's uh, more, I want to point out is that this is really threatening the ongoing good and or even better uh, bilateral relations because just before Mr. Hunt made these remarks, we had the very senior bilateral talks on the economic and the financial cooperations between China and UK. Mm. And uh, I personally, as a stockholder of you know some Shanghai or Shenzhen stocks, I can see, I'm happy to see that the Shanghai London Stock mm. Connect is established. And also, uh, Chinese customers are mm. welcome to enjoy the possible so UK beef in the near future, but that might be understood strengthening under these circumstances. But so did Mr. Hunt, did Mr. Hunt think about all of this, think about the kind of feelings here that will be heard or the kind of sentiments that will be very strong uh, after he says something like that? Um, Ms. Han once again. I, I don't really think so. I think maybe this is not strategic ambiguity, but maybe it's 
more like a tactic ambiguity for his uh, pitch for the next prime minister of UK. Uh, of course, this is my guess, but I, I don't think he's taking that, you know, the welfare of the two uh, countries' people into consideration That's when he made this kind yeah. of remark. It's very interesting you mentioned this, word, uh, this term strategic ambiguity. Mm. Mr. B Professor Brooks, what do you think he's possibly talking about here? Does he know, did he know what he was talking mm -hmm. about or he simply just made it up on the fly? Well, I think when it comes to strategic ambiguity, what he probably meant is uh, not only did he have no idea what the consequence could possibly be, but he was never really going to do anything anyway. I think he's been desperate to show a, a kind of post-Brexit leadership against uh, Boris Johnson, his rival, to be the next prime minister. One of them will be prime minister uh, this month, um, uh, uh, unless uh, something dramatic happens. Uh, and, uh, and he's been behind Boris uh, with Conservative Party members. I think it is as simple as, as trying to grab an issue. I think he's politicizing the situation in Hong Kong to benefit himself. Because if he was speaking on behalf of Her Majesty's government, then you would expect to hear things like, I don't know, Theresa May, the Prime Minister, support this, or anyone uh, else in the government come out and support Jeremy Hunt. He seems to be uh, very much uh, and alone very interesting. in, in, in uh, singling out this as, as an issue and trying to make a lot out, lot out of it yeah. for his own benefit. It's very interesting because, uh, as you said, the UK is actually in, uh, itself in a very peculiar situation, very uncertain situation at this moment. There is no prime minister. Uh, the Brexit is always looming on the horizon, and there is still the debate about what to do. And now, is this the moment for the UK to antagonize China when the UK is talking about a global UK where its global air trade relations is, and political relations are very important. Um, Professor Brooks. Yeah, uh, no, it's not the time to be doing something like this, especially when they've just had this wonderful uh, uh, cooperation setting up that joint uh, market, uh, Shanghai to the city of London, uh, only, only very recently. That seems to have been a great success. Uh, and also in light of the fact that uh, the Britain had, uh, has been standing by its decision to, uh, to use Huawei to help build its 5G networks, it seemed that, that Britain was, despite the Trump administration's uh, protests, seemed that this was still uh, very much uh, going to happen, something that had support in government. So yeah. at a time when Britain seems to have been making a lot of uh, positive signals to China, at the time that Britain really needed to, mm. and needs to find um, closer ties with its good friends like China. This is a comment that I think is irresponsible for the Foreign Secretary to make, especially if he's hoping to be Prime Minister. Yeah. Let's, let's, let's just take a listen of what Chinese Ambassador Liu Xiaoming said during the interview uh, in regards to Mr. Hunt's rhetoric. Let's listen in. We are still committed to this golden era between our two countries. But I cannot agree with the, some politicians uh, description of the relationship, even they use the so-called uh, uh, strategic ambiguity. I think this language does not belong to the vocabulary between China and UK. It's a Cold War mentality language. Hmm. Ms. Han, let me go to you. Uh, what do you think of uh, the, um, Mr. Liu Xiaoming, Ambassador mm -hmm. Liu Xiaoming's rash consideration behind mm -hmm. categorizing the strategic ambiguity mm -hmm. rhetoric into this Cold War mentality? Mm -hmm. Do you think the UK general public could understand the logic behind it too? Uh, I think it's very uh, positive and uh, also give a lot of, you know, uh, the true signal uh, by Ambassador Liu Xiaoming to accept uh, these interviews with, ABC, uh, with BBC or other you know, UK media outlets. It is good mm. for him you know, to give uh, the UK audience the other side of the picture, not only the picture of the Hong Kong, uh, the, the radical movements, the protesters, it's not peaceful anymore. It's going to the very radical uh, direction. This is one part. The UK media failed to do so. As Ambassador Liu Xiaoming, I remember he put it as the professional social responsibility is kind of lacking within the UK media. This is one side. The other side with regard to 
these uh, UK-China golden era relations because Ambassador Liu has been in UK as the China's representative to UK for uh, for a very uh, for a very long time, and he witnessed you know this establishment of this golden era. So I think he valued this golden era's importance, and this is the rightful direction for the UK and China. So yeah. this is we 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 I think as even as a you know individual opinion, we could not bear you know this kind of signal. We need to be alerting of even this is personal statement because by it is very Trump, we should be really alert because it is very easy to disrupt to mm -hmm. destroy a relationship yes. but it's very difficult to rebuild it so I think you yes. need to be extremely careful and uh, concerning the role of the media this is not the first time that uh, ambassador Lu Xiaoming talks about the role of the media he actually when he was giving a presser to uh, through uh, from the uh, em embassy he talked about the UK media being extremely unbalanced he said for instance for the fugitive transfer bill which was what triggered all of the protest. There were about 4,500 survey, surveys that were given to the Hong Kong residents, and about 3,000 of these uh, feedbacks are actually supportive. Were actually mm. supportive of this bill. Only 1,500 were against. But Ambassador Liu Xiaoming said that this kind of voice, this kind of uh, facts, don't really get carried on the, on the on the media in the UK. But the thing is, when you don't talk about both sides of the story, mm. then the possible consequences are going to create a kind of uh, public opinion, and then with that kind of public opinion, politicians feel they probably need to cater to that kind of public opinion. Professor Brooks, am I saying anything mm. wrong here? Mm. <laughs> You're not. I agree entirely with what you say. I think that there's enormous ignorance um, uh, in, in, in the West in general. Britain is not unique. Uh, in, in having ignorance uh, over uh, uh, what, what's happening in China right now or uh, in, uh, at the moment or, or in the recent past. And this is one of the reasons why uh, here at, at Durham Law School I launched a Center for Chinese Law and Policy, the only one uh, in the UK, so that uh, our students studying law, uh, many of whom are Chinese, um, can, can learn about mm -hmm. uh, Chinese law and as they will need to mm -hmm. um, in future. There's an enormous amount of ignorance and I think that that, that other side um, was not being presented at all in the media. And I, I, I think the, the ambassador gets great credit. He'd be certainly welcome mm. to come to uh, Durham if he's listening right now and see our Center for Chinese Law. But I think he gets a lot of credit for, for coming on and, uh, and eloquently uh, giving uh, his side, or uh, the, uh, the government side, um, on the situation on the ground. I thought it was uh, very compelling. Yeah. Well, this, this term is actually very in interesting, the um, social responsibility, right, for the media, because you talk about ethics for the media, you talk, you talk about professionalism. But Han, Han Hua, uh, what do you think of this term? Because this is a, also a very smart use of this mm -hmm. term, but I think it's absolutely fundamental mm -hmm. in what we do, in what journalists around the world do, not just covering their own country, but also covering foreign countries as well. Uh, I think it is very objective for Ambassador Liu to use this term in describing the UK's coverage of this Hong Kong protest. Um, it is, uh, uh, you know, we always, always call for the so co corporate social responsibility when we, you know, discuss about the corporate contrib contributions to the to the world, like we discuss about uh, Huawei's contribution to the UK market in mm. terms of the 5G development. So it's also okay for the media to take up this kind of social responsibility when it comes to, you know, to fully report the yeah. full the full picture, the complete picture of the story. Especially this is the basic, the basic, you know the media can do yeah. about about this and especially when you're talking about a foreign country because mm -hmm. your audience don't have that kind of basic context exactly. they don't have the basic knowledge and thank you I so much to, I have yeah. to leave it there <laughs> oh, maybe sure. next time Ms. Next Han time. next time so many thanks to Han Hua fellow from Chongyang Institute of Renmin University of China and Professor Tom Brooks of Durham uh, Law School in the UK